get things started. So thank you all of you for being here, particularly my guest speakers. Um, this is our very first primary STEM chat where we're on Twitter spaces. And as I was just saying, a big shout out to those in the midst of lockdowns and online learning. Appreciate you being here in, uh, in when so much is going on for you. Um, as most of you may be aware Primary STEM Chat is usually a weekly Twitter chat where we type away frantically for an hour answering questions from our guest hosts. Um, it's nearly four years we've been doing this and next week is our fourth birthday. So that's pretty exciting. It started four years ago with um, two educators, Sally and Fiona and myself. Uh, we just wanted to explore what STEM looked like in that primary school space and share knowledge on how to implement STEM in our school. And so oh, we've had so many different people come and guest host um, and bear their knowledge and experience. And now it's sort of expanded from bit just being primary-based to secondary and tertiary educators and even STEM professionals. So it's a really exciting professional learning network and I know I've learned so much from being part of this. So And it's just great to have STEM-passionate educators. So tonight... We're kind of working like a teach me in the sense that I've invited seven others who have been guest hosts on Primary STEM Chat and have been there along the way um, to share a little about their passion for STEM. They have five minutes, hopefully, um, is enough time to share and then we'll have questions at the end. So if you stick around for the whole time, we've got, we're going to hear from Fee Morrison and we've got Ben joining us. I think he's here now. I'll invite him to speak. Um, we've got Marilyn Fleer, Michelle Dennis, Beck Keogh and Priya. I'm not sure how to say your surname, but it's Rajag, Rajagopalan. 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 I don't know, Priya. <laughs> Rajagopalan. <laughs> yeah. Priya is fine. Priya is fine. Lovely to have you here, Priya and Brian. So we'll be hearing from each of their time. And if you're really good at multitasking, uh, maybe you can listen and tweet at the same time. There's a little arrow on the top left. If you reduce the Twitter spaces feed, you can actually tweet. So you can send questions or make sure if you do do that, you use the primary STEM chat um, hash hashtag so that we can see the tweets. So... For those that don't know me, I'm Rachel Lair. I'm from Perth, Western Australia, passionate STEM um, educator and I'm currently an associate principal and I'm here just to lead the discussion around STEM with these wonderful educators. And we're going to kick off with Fee Morrison. So Fee's recently stepped up to co-host Primary STEM Chat with me. Uh, she's the founder of STEM Ed magazine. If you haven't come across that yet, find it. And she's going to share something about her passion for STEM with us. So I'll hand over to you, Fee, if you're ready. Tell us about I'm your ready. current role and how does STEM fit into that? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Rachel, um, in this chat. Um, it's great to be able to chat with everybody today. Um, I'm Fee Morrison. I'm a U1 teacher um, in Sydney. So Yep, currently in the lockdown, which is fantastic. Um, I'm also a digital literacy coach, which means I support uh, my colleagues in times such as this with getting technology up and running uh, during remote learning, as well as getting it sorted for um, engaging their students in lessons. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, I'm also the founder of STEM Ed Magazine, which is a new magazine um, aimed at supporting educators in STEM education, no matter where they are in their education journey. Um, I, to be honest, before 2020, I knew not very much about STEM education or about technology at all. I would not have said I was a technology person in the slightest. Um, however, when we hit lockdown last year, at the start of last year, I found a lot of my colleagues were turning to me and asking me questions about technology and I kind of became the technology person, um, which is really um, quite funny uh, when I reflect on that. Um, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm a big tech person, but I'm good at troubleshooting and finding solutions to, to problems and things like that. So that's sort of how I fell into my digital literacy coach kind of role. Um, however, my, my passion for STEM really came um, actually from the primary STEM chat. So... Uh, yeah, I started, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's such a good promotion, right? Um, I actually started um, at a new school last year um, with Brian, who's also a part of this chat. 
and Brian was telling me how amazing Twitter is and how I've got to get onto Twitter. I just thought, oh, no, that's another social platform I have to jump on board with. Um, however, I did, and I stuck it out. The last 12 months, 18 months, I've learned so much from the primary STEM chat PLN. Um, I, I've grown in my confidence in incorporating STEM into them as well as trying to share that with other educators as well, which is why, obviously, the STEM magazine has come about. Um, and so for me, I'm just really passionate about getting educators to have a go at STEM education. I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of educators who just think that STEM is something else that I have to fit into my curriculum. It's something else that I have to program for and plan for and how do I fit it all in when we've got such a crowded curriculum. Um, and I'm just really passionate about sharing with educators that to me, and I think Rachel and I had this conversation the other day that STEM is, is it's a pedagogy and it's a mindset. So it's not just those curriculum areas of science, technology, engineering, math, but it's actually also a way of being able to um, engage our students in experiences, authentic, meaningful, um, real life experiences that are going to help them develop skills um, that they're going to need for um, for their daily lives. So those things like flexibility, resilience, problem critical creativity, collaboration, you know, all of those skills that we want our students to, um, it's through those STEM education, like those STEM experiences that we um, create for our students that they can really develop those skills. So I'm really passionate about helping educators to sort of move beyond the, I have to fit STEM into my program to, it's actually a way of teaching and a way of helping students develop those skills. Um and I'm also passionate about STEM in the early years. So I'm a year one teacher. So I'm really, really passionate about getting our youngest to educate, uh, youngest, sorry, students um, involved in that nitty gritty STEM learning. And I know that there's other speakers who are going to speak to that very shortly. Um, That's yeah. all a very amazing feat. And I love that whole idea of just encouraging people to have a go, to get out there and yeah. try it and, and, and not seeing it as something in it inaccessible in any way and that it's yeah. possible for all of us so the work you're doing around making that accessible for everyone through your stem ed magazine is amazing too now you've actually answered all nearly all of the questions i gave you ahead of time but i do wonder if you could just give one piece of advice to someone that's just starting out with mm. stem and they really aren't sure what what would that be fee yeah i am um, i'm i'm really keen for educators to just give it a go um just just get started and um i've been speaking a lot with chris chris woods about this we have a mutual friend liz gallo from Wymaker in america and she's got this quote that i think is just brilliant and it's copy change create so if you're not sure where to get started with stem education copy what someone else is doing have a look at what someone else is doing and this is what i found last year with this primary stem chat it's fantastic for ideas um, and if I'm not sure of how to get started with something, I'll ask people on primary STEM chat and I'll go, okay, I'm just going to copy that in my classroom and give that a go. And then once you become comfortable with, you know, you've had, you've copied a few ideas and you're like, okay, I've kind of got that rhythm of, of what to do. You can then start to, to change it and modify it to meet your curriculum, your learning, your students. Um, and then once you've done that for a little while, obviously you become more confident again to then be able to, create your own experiences so I love that quote and that's what I always um, share with people is that copy change create I love that fee and you'd be surprised to know that your time is long up <laughs> time Sorry. flies when you're having fun but what um quote and just that whole idea of you don't have to recreate the wheel or start anything new um just take what's out there and adapt so thank you for sharing your thoughts if anyone has any questions for fee post them on twitter put the hashtag there um we'll have some time at the end for people if they want to put their hand up to speak so we're going to move on now to ben um you've you've joined us ben i see you're there uh ben is an author and he's the founder of physics ed he has um the fabulous physics ed podcast and he's also the co-founder of the excursions australia i just discovered when i was looking at his profile i'll hand over you to ben to share what's your role and how does stem fit into it Hi, everyone. I was actually just, uh, I thought I might get last. I, was like, I might just try and find a tweet that actually supports uh, what we're doing tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Ben Newsom, and 
I do like, <laughs> do I do? I really love STEM and what we stand for and what we do. And um, I mean, the work that you've been doing, uh, Rachel, has been spectacularly awesome. And I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, what some of your questions that you posed about, you know, what should we talk about tonight? I mean, I'm going to go straight to what uh, number two, which is, you know, what sparked my interest in STEM. Honestly, I would say primary STEM chat as well as really teachers in all sorts of classrooms. I've been lucky enough to go to so many schools over the years. So just really quickly, I do outreach for a living. And, uh, and I just quickly will just share that uh, wakelet that you've been um, doing really, you know, collecting yeah, religiously. Oh, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to do it in a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's just not connecting. Oh, there we go. It is doing it now. There you go. Cool. It's in. All right. So that's the wake that Rachel, Rachel does. I just thought I'd just throw that in there into, into it. And that will be in above our heads now. Um, yeah. So the I, I do outreach to schools. I uh, have done for the last 17 years through, through physics ed. We can't spell, but we do do a lot of teaching of science. Uh, and because of this, we see lots of ways that teachers use uh, STEM to really grab kids' passions and ignite them in the understanding about their world. And that to me is why I love STEM. I love how it's all about uh not just solving projects just for the sake of it, it's actually really training their brains to really uh, do this in the big wide world as well as in, the, in their homes, in, whether in grade three or grade six or grade 10, it doesn't matter. They're really training their brains around this. And it's so very, very cool. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So that my current role is outreach, is what I do. And I love what teachers do in STEM and that's what sparks my interest. Uh, something I'm really uh, super passionate about when it comes to STEM is really I do love <laughs> I do love seeing uh, unusual uses of materials. Uh, a good example is uh, the cardboard challenge that you see. Uh, is, uh, if you just type into your favorite uh, uh, search engine, type in cardboard challenge, and you see people uh, yeah, repurposing old bits of cardboard to create arcade games. Uh, and kids love this. I mean, I just love just how you can really look at materials in a completely different way. If you say, oh, yeah, that could be a lever, that could be a pulley, that could be a thing. And then when you strap a... Uh, uh, technology tools over the top of it. That's really, really cool. Uh, so uh, quick advice. Uh, uh, someone who's new to STEM learning, um, I'd hang out with other like-minded educators. Hang out in primary STEM chat. Hang out in any place where educators want to talk about STEM in different ways and learn from each other and don't stop learning. And um, that's, that's, I suppose that might be for me for now. Uh, this has been done speaking. And what great advice, Ben. Um, just hang out with all the cool people. <laughs> that's where it's at. Um, I, I know that I've learned so much from everybody that's willing to give up their time to come to places like this on a Thursday evening or on a Thursday morning for some of the, those that join um, us from America and other places. So, um, And I really like that idea of unusual uses of materials and that sparks that curiosity in students. So thank you for sharing and thank you for being here. Um, if you have any questions for Ben, please tweet them out. Use the hashtag, tag um, him in that, Ben Newsom. And now, Marilyn, are you there and ready? Um, we'd like to hear from Marilyn. She's a laureate professor and director of the Conceptual Play Lab at Monash University. And I'm really excited to hear, Marilyn, about your current role and how STEM fits I'm in. Marilyn, <laughs> there you are. You dropped off being a speaker for a moment, but you're back. Are you oh, ready yeah. to tell us about your role and STEM and how that fits into it? I am absolutely ready. I can't believe that I've actually got back in somehow. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right. Over so, to you, Marilyn. All right. Thanks. And so nice to be part of the group. This is such an exciting group to be a part of every week and it's terrific that we're all chatting away at, in uh, in real time with real voices. Um, so my current role, um, I work at Monash University and, and I lead a, um, a, a conceptual play lab where we, looking, where we look at researching intentional teaching um, in STEM and, um, and it's a really big project and we are working with teachers, uh, we're working with um, uh, uh, researchers in, and in early childhood settings and uh, so my role is, is I suppose, a bit like a CEO or something, like principal of a school, or, um, to, to make all of that um, tick along so that we can find out, um, learn about um, the best way to take forward STEM education for, um, for the early years. And so that's the birth to eight years of age and find out what's the best way to take that forward for families. Um, so we're learning a lot about families and and the current context with with lockdown again. That's getting more and more challenging. 
and um, and we're also looking at um, how how concepts change over time for children. So when they're babies, when they're toddlers, when they're preschoolers, when they're in school, how, how does their thinking change in STEM? So they're, they're the three things we do. So I look after that. And I guess what sparked my interest in, in STEM, um, if I can go right back to when I, when I was actually um, at school myself, um, the things that I loved the most was always science and technology uh, probably wasn't called that then, but uh, I just loved it. Um, and I loved it because I came to school as um, uh, not speaking English. So it was it was kind of the most accessible kind of language, if you like, for me. And um, and it was just so exciting to be a, a part of a part of all the STEM things that did happen. And I know that we often say that not a lot of STEM happens in schools, but I think there's heaps um, going on. And um, and it was, for me as a child at school, was fantastic. So that got me really inspired. And I've never looked back because it's always been my passion. Um, what a, And then that takes me to what's specifically uh, I'm passionate about, and that is that we've come up with a... Um, uh, after 10 years of research, we've come up with um, how to bring STEM concepts into into play um, and, and how play can be the vehicle for imagination and creativity in STEM. And our conceptual play worlds model is so exciting for me. And and we're finding through the professional development that um, that we offer for free that the people who participate love it as well. Um, and we've got STEM champions like Fee, for instance, um, who who um, talk about it as well. And and the and what is it? The conceptual play worlds. If for those of you who don't know, it's taking up taking a story, a children's book, a fairy tale. Um, anything at all that has it's got a, a, has a narrative, but it has lots of drama in it and excitement. So, um, Alice in Wonderland sets up the uh, is is an example of a fantastic book. It's got lots of drama in it, and down the rabbit hole, um, uh, as uh, role playing it and being in this imaginary play world creates possibilities for for looking into the soil and. Um, imagining that you're there, part of it, and then going and doing research when you're not, not, not actually Alice or the White Rabbit or, or the Queen or any of the other characters role playing, and um, and adding to the drama of the story. So so then the science, um, or the tech actually feeds the the play. So the play becomes richer and more exciting, and the um, and the because because of the STEM learning, and then that just continues to compound, if you like. And and the other part of the conceptual play world um, for the intentional teaching of STEM is 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 that the teachers and the the children are all in character, all going into these amaz- amazing pretend spaces, and they also go and do the research uh, together to find out more. So using YouTube or um, looking in books, setting up experiments to try things out, and so on. So that so that when you when you're looking at microbes in the soil. You know, you're learning about the compost bin and what's going on there in terms of microbes, and then you might be um, setting up a um, a camera to to take still photos um, of old on the sandwiches that you've sort of set up. So lots of little things like that, which just add complexity to it all. So, um, and advice? What what advice would I give for um, um, what would I give for um, people new to STEM? I guess for me. It's 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 a bit like we've been asked to to talk about in terms of our questions about what is the passion here? What what are we really passionate about? And I think I think for those that are new to STEM, just follow your heart, follow that excitement, the drama of the emotions, all of those things. Build them into the STEM because they matter. And 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 so even even if you're feeling anxious or you're new to some some particular particular concept that you want. Teach, just go with the excitement of it, and um, and not just learn along with the children, but then um, s- set up these wonderful experiences where everybody gets excited about the learning of of particular concepts. So that that would be my advice. 
So back to you, Rachel. <laughs> Marilyn, I had very big intentions of tweeting out what everyone was saying, but I've just been in awe listening to your chat. It was, I mean, to your advice and all of you that you've said, and it was just so amazing. It sounds like the work you're doing is just brilliant and what a great place to be. And all those th- that advice about following your heart. And I like what you talked about being playful with STEM, and I think at its essence STEM is a playful learning area. And so you've shared so much that I've taken away and I didn't tweet any of it out because I was listening so intently so my apologies about that but if you have any questions for Marilyn post them out on Twitter put the hashtag and also I see that Beck has shared a link to the conceptual play wheel so make sure you follow up on that because it just is some amazing work that's being done in that space now we are going to move along to Michelle Dennis so Michelle is the head of digital learning at Halebury and she is an advocate for STEAM and student voice and creativity and she's also a Microsoft innovative educator and that is a tongue twister. Um, but Michelle, I'll leave it to you to tell us about your role and STEM and how that fits into what you're doing currently. Thank you. Um, I'm My role is head of digital at Halebury, um, which is a very large school in Melbourne. Um, we've got four campuses in Melbourne, a campus in the Northern Territory and a campus in China. Um, And overseeing the digital life of the school, um, it offers a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting opportunities though. One of the things I'm fascinated about is how we can have whole school change when it comes to STEM and STEAM. Um, When you look at all the great work happening in one or two classrooms. It always makes me sad when these kids get so excited and their minds get really opened and they start asking questions and then they go to the next teacher's class in the next year level and it's a different experience. And I I would love to see... um, What I would like to do is really try and help create an environment where um, this happens culturally across the board. So um, when I was at Strathcona with Eleni, um, Eleni Karitsis, who's very well known as well, um, uh, we created something called the Tinker. That's why we created it, which was a design thinking model for um, STEM and STEAM in the classroom. And the idea was by having it explicit and owned by the school, it could be used by every single student and teacher as they grow grew up and went from year level to year level. I, where, well, I'll talk about what sparked my interest in STEM education if I can, but my problem is that I grew up surrounded by STEM. I think that it's a sign of why we should start STEM education and the love of STEM so early because um, I grew up with parents who used to be geologists who would point at uh, rocks as we drove along and explain how they were created by glaciers and you could tell that from the surface of the rocks. Um, A father who could code in the early 1980s and so and a computer Um, And so I was always curious in asking questions and it's all I've ever really known. And it's something I would like every child to experience because when you ask questions and you have curiosity, the world is an amazing, magical place. The thing I'm really passionate, though, is about getting more girls into STEM. Um, I went to an all-girls school. I've always been great at tech and I thought that was just the way it was. And then I went to university where it was 17% female and I suddenly went, oh, I'm unusual. This very strange experience. And when you are disproportionately um, underrepresented like that, it can make you feel a bit other and it is a little bit of an isolating experience. And the thing is that tech and STEM is something that is changing our world so dramatically the people who are in innovating and creating change, they're the ones who are making decisions about how we make friends, how, how we run PVs, how we um, drive our cars and what happens to our data. And um, if, if you look at the medical side, a whole lot more complicated things than that, how, how we vaccinate. Um, and so I think that if we don't have women at least equally represented, we cut out that conversation 
So that's one of the things that got me into education was just wanting to hopefully inspire more girls to take up STEM and STEAM. There's one piece of advice that I would offer. Um, there's a picture book called Beautiful Oops, and I absolutely love it. It's, um, it's all about the beauty of, beauty of mistakes. One of the problems that I see, particularly in high-performing schools, is that students aim for 100% perfection, and they want the easy way of doing it. They want the algorithm to 100%. And once they get that, they're done. They, I'm not serious. But there is a cultural issue sometimes where um, mistakes aren't held with the esteem they should be, that students don't um, try things just for the fun of it or learn just for the fun of it, that they don't take things one step further. Um, and um, I'd love for you, if you're new to STEM learning, to try and do is try and embrace that attitude of beautiful oops and do something like put a board on one board of the classroom up where you celebrate when someone's taken a risk and it's gone terribly wrong in the most wonderful way. Um, and we turn, change that narrative about failure and into a celebration of the challenge and the attempt um, and the bravery it takes to do something new. So that's something, that's the one thing I um, would say with STEM is that you need to encourage people to try or else... Um, they're not going to create the magic that we know they're capable of. Michelle, <laughs> I think I'll cover that. <laughs> you are amazing. I, I've just been listening to the passion in your voice and that makes all the difference for our students. Like I can really tell that you are really, you are so passionate about what you do and that beautiful, oops, I have never seen it before, but what a great recommendation. And I, like you, am passionate about girls in STEM and um, making those opportunities so and I also like what you just said at the beginning about the digital life of the school and I thought oh, that's a really interesting way to speak about it so thank you for sharing your thoughts at those that have just joined us or have been here the whole time if you've got questions for Michelle post them on Twitter and put the hashtag and we'll hopefully get to those at the end and now we're actually going to move right on over to Beck Kim. Beck um, there and ready. Beck is a founder of Edulate, which sounds very fun, um, and it's a virtual coffee lounge and podcast space for teachers. And Beck's going to tell us about her role and how STEM fits into it. Thanks for the invitation, Rachel. It's a real privilege to be among some really inspiring and um, and enthusiastic educators. My name is Beck Keo. Um, I'm a primary school teacher. Um, I have taught from preschool through to year six, um, any KLA, all KLAs, and I love them all. I love the littlest student to the largest student. Um, how does STEM fit into my role? Well, being a primary school teacher, obviously um, educating across all learning areas is important to me. And um, I think that links into what actually kind of sparked interest in STEM, and I'll, I'll link this in in a couple of ways. I, um, I grew up in the bush. And um, I actually did distance ed learning for quite some time. So for me, there was a lot of hands-on learning. There was a lot of making and doing. My life was all of that. We did a lot of hands-on stuff. So coming into education and um, hands-on stuff, was it just made sense. And that notion of solving problems and um, in an authentic and purposeful way has just been a part of my whole life. As an educator, it just fit with me um, as with everything I do. I think one of the things that really spurred me on to really get on this, the uh, the bandwagon was um, looking at a lot of commercial content that was just being regurgitated year after year and watching the yawning of the students. And I thought, no, there's no connectivity to real life here. What can we do? And so that's when I went on a, um, a little bit of an adventure. And I had the privilege of working along um, Dr. Jane Hunter on her High Possibility Classroom project um, with school I was working with. And at that moment... My eyes were opened and I went, this is what I've been looking for. Um, that's kind of, I guess, encapsulated um, what has become my passion in STEM ed. And that is um, no silos. I don't like silos. I talk about these whimsical windmills that are constantly turning and um, rethinking the way we do things, but always through, you know, a student-centred perspective and with a um I guess an authentic audience and authentic purpose to whatever we're doing so I love it for example when we bring in a, um, a stem concept but we're not only 
making and doing, but we're writing about what we're doing in an authentic way. So bringing that literacy element in and everything we're doing, we're living and breathing all that we're doing within our classroom through um, through a STEM lens. I just, I can, it's just such a powerful platform. And I'm yet to find a student that doesn't love a bit of STEM learning. Um, I um, love to do integrated learning. So my um, the way I teach or the way I love to um, to teach is um, is through that integrated inquiry approach. I really like it when I can find a purpose, as I mentioned. So um, finding digging deep and um, conceptually planning where there's a big picture. Um, concept but then everything we do is what we call in my classroom dot to dot learning and I remember last year I had a little boy go hey Mrs Keo, we learned a bit of this in um, in English but now we're learning some in science I can see how all these dots are going together just like a big dot to dot puzzle and that just made me go yes you get it why can't all educators get it a bit about bit more about my role. Um, I'm also, um, as Fee is a digital literacy coach and mentor. Um, I have worked on the Digital Technology in Focus project with ACARA, so I'm a digital literacies expert now in um, the new digital curriculum. I've worked on the HPC project with Jane Hunter, and um, in encapsulating all that. How, what would I say to somebody who's coming in or wanting to um, dive into this STEM field? Find your people. These people that are here now, they, they are our people. Twitter has been where I have found my people. I live, um, as I mentioned, well, I grew up in the bush and it was hard for me to find my people because I, I did, um, you know, grew up on a property and um, when I went to town, it was hard to find people who thought like me. And um, Twitter has been that space for me. I have um, connected with a lot of like-minded people who have um, opened my eyes to more possibilities and the connectivity in the community here, um, I'll be quite honest, but living really, it's something that keeps me going. So I love jumping on these um, conversations and learning with and from um, these powerful educators that stand around here this evening. So thanks for having me, Rachel. Beck, the passion that shines through with you too. I'm just in awe of everyone that's been here tonight that is here because I hear it in your voice and I love what you talked about making connections because if we don't make those connections, and I like the idea too of dot-to-dot -dot learning, showing how everything is linked um, and, you know, everything is connected and, and by showing that to our students, it makes it so much more meaningful. And, of course, you're speaking to my heart when you're talking about finding your people. So um, you'll know if you have ever been on my Twitter account I do talk about sparkle and you're all sparkling tonight so <laughs> very happy about that and, and and it's just that willingness for us all to um, help others sparkle too which is what you're all doing so thank you very much for um, sharing that Beck. and I'm going to move over to Priya now. Priya is joining us from Singapore and she's a visual arts educator there. She's an Apple teacher, a Google certified educator, a CISO ambassador and much more, but I'll let Priya share her story. So Priya, do tell us about your role and STEM and how it fits into your role. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. This is my first Twitter space experience and I'm already enjoying this. Uh, again, it proves a wonderful learning platform, Twitter, Twitter Spaces, and of course, the BEP PLN. Um, I'm a visual art educator in an IB school here in Singapore, uh, but I'm also an art therapist and mixed media artist by myself. And uh, before I came into education, art and art therapy and all the stuff, I was a software programmer, developer, and I have a bachelor's in chemistry. So where my curiosity about STEM comes from in so uh, in my art classroom, I teach young children's grade one, two, three, and it's a lot about playing with art materials and exploring the piece like scientists. We are a little scientist in an art classroom and that's where STEM fits in. We explore lots of technologies and new way to create arts through animations or digital stylus and many things, many pro uh, things that we explore. So I would definitely, definitely say STEM has a great place in an art classroom. And um, for me, what sparked my interest in STEM education, I would say one thing that absolutely is nature. Um, I'm an avid nature journalist and art journalist. And uh, 
I explore both scientific drawing and also whimsical artworks inspired by nature. And I, when I'm doing, I and mean, when I was practicing this nature journal, I found that it was a great way to use it in my classroom to uh, introduce the concept of curiosity and creative to build these skills of creativity and curiosity in my kids because I think that's one of the essential skills for our students. And it's I also found it a very transdisciplinary way. Like I could incorporate drawing, I could incorporate maths, I could incorporate. Uh, literacy, writing, scientific vocabulary, uh, and many more. It just I, I just found it really awesome. So that's how I thought that's a wonderful way to, in another way other than exploring materials and its properties, I thought there's another way to incorporate STEM in my art classroom. Um, and being an art therapist, and I also found so much of healing power of nature, and especially this pandemic year, and I introducing the concept connecting them to nature and I, I found it a very beautiful way for them to heal and ex uh, at the same time learn about stem at the same time work towards their well-being and um, so one of my goals uh, is of course incorporate stem art at the same time to get my children to think about their well-being a holistic way of learning that's been my goal i would say and I'm learning in this process, and it's, it's, it's been a wonderful year, especially to think about the therapeutic aspect of STEM art and all other forms. One piece of advice I would say is uh, for the person, for people who are coming new to STEM is not to be very self-critical. Just like what Michelle said, I think mistakes are part of the learning and use it as an opportunity to grow. And I would say nature journaling is one example drawing every day or going out in the nature every day and exploring uh, it every day. So I, I normally segregate it as knowing, doing, and being. So when you learn what you learn in STEM, you know some STEM concepts and doing it every day, we become it being. And that's my advice, I would say, for people who just learn, do, and you will become it, even if you're not uh, sure about it in the beginning. Thank you. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Priya. I just love that whole idea of just not being critical because I think as educators we can tend to be really hard on ourselves and we think we want to get we need to get things perfect. And so that whole idea of just having a go and we've we've heard that a lot tonight and and also on curiosity and creativity and I think they are the threads that go through STEM um, along with uh, you know c critical thinking and others the other C's. But you know the curiosity is what drives our learning, our desire to explore. And the creativity allows us to show our learning in so many different ways. So thank you for sharing those thoughts and for being here. And we're moving on to our last speaker. So for waiting around, Brian, I know that it's been a lot, a lot of waiting for you, but Brian Host is here. He's an educational leader, presenter, coach and aspiring author. And I actually didn't know that, so I'll have to find out more about your book, Brian. Um, Brian loves using ed tech, STEM and inquiry to spark wonder and curiosity. So tell us more, Brian. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, I'm Brian. I do come from, um, I herald from Sydney or just south of Sydney and currently um, as an educational leader, I'm supporting my team um, in in pivoting to remote le learning for the next little bit of time. Um, yeah, basically I have um, been in the role of coordinator of primary since the start of the year. Prior to that, I was at um, the school that Fiona Morrison work, currently works at, um, and I spent 11 years at that school um, working on building the, the uh, digital technologies capabilities and the STEM capabilities of um, many of the, the staff and students. So it's been great to sit back and watch um, Fee continue to see that that legacy grow. Um, so in my in STEM, basically, I was inspired um, as a disengaged student when when I was back in primary school. I was very much not not switching on, not um, really engaged at all. And one of my um, areas of interest was, was science. And the other area of interest was technology. And my third area of interest was um, sport, being gymnastics. And my one of my year five teachers, um, I don't know whether he purposely did it for me or um, yeah, just to try and get the whole class engaged, he turned up in a um, scientist outfit 
um, with a bit bit of frizzy hair and ended up doing a cartwheel across the classroom, from the classroom. And at that moment, I suddenly had, uh, I saw a legend in the classroom. I'm going to switch on here. Um, again, I had a similar sort of experience in year seven when I um, had an agriculture teacher who did a very similar sort of thing, didn't do a cartwheel across the classroom, but um, just spent a lot of time mentoring students who um, and ended up um, really triggering that interest in science and technology. Um, thankfully, I've been able to continue on um, seeing those glimpses in my students and using um, STEM not in a silo way, using STEM as a pedagogy and leading teachers to understand that it's not um, science, it's not technology, it's not engineering, art and in isolation it actually has to work across across those streams to effectively um, transform the learning for students so um, something I'm really passionate about is seeing students grow in their learning dis dispositions I'm a passionate inquiry based teacher um, and I, I like to actually blend a lot of STEM, STEM learning inquiry and as a pedagogy backing that up I use TPAC as as my model in which I grow that. So um, again, I was I've been very to do a fair bit of work with Jane Hunter in the past. So if you haven't actually um, come across her work, please reach out to her, and um, I'm sure she would be willing to support. Same with Trevor McKenzie and Kath Murdoch. Those are two other um, edu heroes, so to speak, to that I look to. And loving the work of Guy Claxton at the moment around learning dispositions. Um, any advice? I would say go for the long term game. Don't try and rush things. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, we we see a lot of burnout of teachers, and as a result, um, if we try and rush things, that burnout rate happens even higher, especially if we're in remote mode at the moment. If you look back in the last 18 months, there's so much change that's happened in technology um, and in the classroom because of that technology. So um, there are wins that we've had. Now just try and look back and take those wins and continue to amplify those. There was something that I tweeted the other day. Uh, we we shouldn't be – our pedagogy should not be limited by technology but we should use the technology to amplify and enhance our pedagogy. So um, as much as you can, try and find ways to use the technology, use the um, available material, whether that's a pencil or whether it's a, a computer or any other form, to get the kids more engaged, get the kids experimenting, exploring, and having a bit of fun with it. STEM is all about fun hard fun learning it's not about um just trying something pulling a robot off the shelf it's actually about that that rich deep learning and it's not always the easiest thing both for students and the teachers i'm brian and i've finished talking thank you so much brian it was so awesome to hear from you and i have lots of takeaways i've been scribbling notes while i've been listening to you but i do like that whole idea of stem as being hard learning i hadn't heard that one before so thank you for that and and i think that's really sage advice about playing that long game um and you know really thinking about our tech use in terms of making sure it's meaningful and not just grabbing onto the latest innovation just for the sake of it so a lot of really great advice in there and also i love how you thought it, um your passion was about seeing the students grow in our learning and i think that's why we're all here isn't it you know it's about seeing the students grow so thank you so much for being here brian and everyone else and now we do have a bit of time if there are any questions, whether the speakers have questions for each other or if any of our listeners. And Fee, I don't know if you've had a chance to see if there's any questions on Twitter, but are there questions for any of our presenters? I haven't seen any questions pop up. There's a lot of discussion um, about what the presenters have been saying, which is fantastic. So anyone here listening have a question? Happy to take some questions from you or a comment or something you want to share? I was a 
I was actually just thinking that um, an interesting way we could uh, run this in the future too would be um, having some sort of poll as well because, I mean, polls you can press on, but it's uh, it's, uh, (laughs) flicking between audio and across the Twitter thing. But, yeah, it would be interesting to see how we could do that. Just an idea. Ben Dunn speaking. Uh, is there polls you can do within Spaces? I'm very new to Twitter Spaces, so uh, maybe more. No, no, but I suspect what we could do though is um, you could share something like through Poll Everywhere or something like that uh, into a tweet above our heads, uh, right. and then we click on that and then we go from there. Just, just, as a, just this is a thought bubble, uh, not fully conceived. <laughs> ben done <laughs> speaking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is there anyone else out there with a comment or a question? The other Our thing you could do is quiet. actually get the uh, if you're looking at polls, you can actually run a, a poll through the text-based um, version. So when yeah. you you've got an option to poll when you tweet. Yes, you can Great do idea. that. Well. If we don't have any questions, I will just end by saying thank you so much for all of you to, for being here tonight, for all of those that have given up their time to talk about their passion for STEM and everyone that stayed here to listen. And I um, know that I've learned a lot just from listening and I think my biggest takeaway is that there are so many passionate educators out there that I'm so thankful that we have you all. And I look like we might have someone wanting to speak. It's Rusty. Rusty, you there? I've just, are you there, Rusty? Oh, hi. I just wanted to say it's great to hear everybody's voices. All of these wonderful people for the last two years that I've been listening in and tweeting along and, you know, trying to add a a really funny um, shit's creek. um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's just great to hear the voices and um, also um, the fact that you were able to answer the questions in you know like a little um four minute grab rather than um uh, you know a series of tweets so i really really enjoyed that and um um also would love anyone to come along to clubhouse 7 30 on thursday just before primary stem chat um to talk about um stem pedagogical models and which ones are the best rusty and done speaking Thank you, Rusty. Thanks for being here. And I did join you on Clubhouse tonight and had lots of fun. So that was a great experience for any that are interested in joining. So unless we have anyone else putting their hand up to speak, I will just thank you all. Thanks, Fee and Ben and Marilyn and Michelle and Beck and Priya and Brian. I have loved this experience and loved hearing your voices as we've just heard. So over and out from me. So thank you for being here and thank you for being part of the Primary STEM chat community. It really is the best place. And you all sparkle. So thank you and I will end it here a little early. But do continue the conversation on Twitter and use the hashtag. Thanks again, everyone. And all the best for those in lockdown. Good night.